Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to explore the sociology of ufology. With me is Zen Benefiel, who is the curator and host of a website called Ufology Press, ufologyprss.com. He is also the author of many books, including Cosmic Conundrum, Who Are You Really? A workbook, as well as Stubbing My Big Toe and The God Participle. Welcome again, Zach. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. It's great to be here and such an honor. Um, I, I don't have a big toe. <laughs> <laughs> I actually stole the title in, in some respects from, from, some, Tom, um, from Campbell, Tom, Ca right, from Tom Campbell and, and his work. My um, big toe and right. his toe meaning theory of everything. Correct. Yeah. And so that's kind of a double entendre of stubbing my toe mm -hmm. on purpose. Ah, so not I only misspoke. am I, yeah. that, that, that's fine, but uh -huh. you know, it, it's, I think too much sometimes and put too much into things, think, thinking that people get it, right? <laughs> um, so I did this with that book and, mm -hmm. you know, my meaning for it was that I'm constantly, you know, running into stuff, willing to be wrong mm -hmm. in order to find out what my true purpose is and the form, fit, and function mm -hmm. of it in this world. And it also it suggests to me you're looking for a theory of everything. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you know, being able to question mm -hmm. everything in the yeah. process, knowing that when I find the right questions, the answers will be there. And you have, uh, as part of your quest, you have immersed yourself in the UFO world. I have. And, and I'm not sure if that was by choice or by crook. Um, because a little of both, probably. I, I think so. You know, the beginning experiences as a child that I had and, and not really understanding what they were until I was in my early 20s, then having some questions about that in my late 20s, early 30s, having this whole thing about the Ashtar Command come up and wondering what to do with it, and then, uh, you know, eventually having mm -hmm. to look at, okay, what's the practical things that are here, what's the information that's available, who all is out there, what mm -hmm. are they saying, and through a serendipitous event, we were able to put together Ufology Press, which is a curated site that has over a hundred blogs from around the world, all focused on ufology and the paranormal. And of course, we also have authors and books and uh, groups and things that are advertised mm -hmm. on it. It's given me the ability, and I'd hope to begin with, to have a virtual example of people working together even though they didn't know they were. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that would raise the bar for everybody else yeah. and, and in that idea that maybe we can all learn to work uh -huh. together better and figure out what's going on rather than trying to tear each other mm -hmm. asunder. Well, I think uh, for the benefit of our viewers, we should point out you are not really trained as a sociologist. It's not your profession. No. No, I have an MBA mm -hmm. and uh, a Master of Arts in Organizational Management, mm -hmm. uh, secondary cert for teaching, and uh, transformational life coach certification. So I, I would say that makes you very well positioned because you have in effect been a, part over? a participant <laughs> observer, a right. participant observer yeah, of absolutely. the UFO scene. You, you're not just an outside observer, like a sociologist looking in, studying. Sure. You, you have had contact experiences. You uh, are a participant in the UFO world. And, and but at the same time, you, you have, uh, you're educated and you can see things, I think, relatively objectively. That's my hopes and, mm -hmm. and my willingness to question even my own experience and how I might deceive myself or distract myself and mm -hmm. what my own intentions are and things of that nature gives me at least a, a foundation from which to grow from yeah. that is a little more objective, um, 
I may not know anything. You know, sometimes I feel like I know nothing. <laughs> well, that's, you, you already brought up the notion of the Ashtar Command. And I think almost everybody who has dug into the UFO literature has probably come across that term. But probably very few people really know what's behind it. So maybe that's a good place to start. Sure. Um, I think it's a great place to start. You know, when I first was introduced to it, uh, I didn't really know what it was. I was just starting to have a quest in the metaphysical realms again. I was coming out of a divorce, looking at, okay, where's my passion and, and what do I want to find out about? And as I started exploring, I actually started a metaphysical discussion group. And there was some discussion about, you know, the Galactic Federation, the Ashtar Command, and I'm wondering about it. And then uh, through a series of events, I find myself going to see a couple of channelers that are talking about, mm -hmm. uh, or they're channeling Ashtar and Athena. Mm -hmm. And it fit with what they said fit with kind of a gut-level feeling that well, I let, had. Now let's, let's just stop for a moment. Okay. Most people will recognize that Athena is, is an ancient Greek goddess. As we know it, yes. yes. And, and that's a historical reference. That mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily put it in, but it's uh, it would be a reasonable assumption to think people would make the leap to connect the two. And I, and I believe Ashtar is also an ancient deity, Sumerian, I think. Ishtar, not Ashtar. Ah, okay. Good okay. point. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a gentleman named Dan Winter one time said to me, you know, Ashtar is the acronym for the cosmic computer. Yes. Okay. So are we a computer matrix, you know, like Tom Campbell was talking about? Are we in a virtual reality? Who's in charge? What's our avatar doing? How much can we control it? And, you know, uh -huh. all of that kind of all stuff. All good questions. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but with the Ashtar Command, in essence, they are overseeing the, for lack of a better, solar, S-O-U-L, contracts for the volunteers that have come here to assist in the development of our planetary civilization. Okay. And, but I gather that these beings who are like deities are uh, said to be uh, in operating in a, uh, a spaceship of some sort, a UFO. Some feel that, depending on what's necessary in order for us to understand, is how they present themselves, right? right? It may be totally different, mm -hmm. and this is the only way that we have them. But there, I also gather that within the UFO community, there are uh, more than one individuals who are, are said to be channelers in behalf of the Ashtar group or command or... They are, and, mm -hmm. and you can filter that information as you please, and, and you know your viewers can do the same. Uh, I've tried to stay away from that mm -hmm. because I have found through my own research and study and my own sessions of channeling and the period that I went through in, in doing it. Mm -hmm. You mean that, with yourself as a channeler? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, humans still have filters. Mm-hmm. And no matter what we, how clear we think we are, those filters present themselves in how we distribute information. And this is certainly going to be an issue uh, with regard to uh, accepting the information coming from any channeler. Mm -hmm. We should all be willing to be questioned. Yeah. Right? How yeah. else can we find out? Mm -hmm. You know, we're not some deity on high saying this is the way it is and you have to accept it we're not built that way some of us may want to be built that way because mm -hmm. you know we fail to have a lack of accountability and responsibility mm -hmm. in, in how we act and behave mm -hmm. uh, in the world from that perspective or that we're willing to accept something that then brings us into the idea of a UFO cult, yeah. you know, where they're focused around an individual and this individual has supreme authority and they get people to do things that they may not have always, mm -hmm. you know, would have done otherwise. Uh, I, I think that there's a reasonable, a practical sense of authenticity, of reality, of being able to, to distill this information yeah to make it useful and practical in our lives. Otherwise, 
what good is it? It just, mm-hmm. you know, it's uh, mental fodder and it. Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of perturbations that can come from of it. And by and large, most of them aren't healthy. Now, you used another phrase a moment ago, yeah. uh, galactic council. I believe you use that phrase. I, galactic federation, but uh-huh. council could yeah. be the... And, synonymous, and I suppose. It's widely accepted, I gather, or at least it's accepted by many people in the uh, community of people who attend UFO conferences right. and, and UFO websites that uh, there's a relationship between an organization or a group known as the Ashtar Command and the Galactic Council or the Galactic Federation. Federation. The Ashtar Command is a an arm of the Federation that's responsible for this locale, mm-hmm. this being our solar system and several others. In, the in, in other words, this little tiny wing of, of the galaxy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And as far as I know, their access, their ability to enhance our lives comes through getting us to think differently, mm-hmm. getting us to become aware of everything around us. Mm -hmm. We often are so caught up in not paying attention to what we're caught up by our distractions. We're we're not able to silence our mind and look around and just absorb and observe what's happening around us and let it interpret itself to us. Mm -hmm. We generally think things and then want to supplant our definition on this reality, true or not. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm under the impression, I have not attended a, a UFO conference for a very long time, maybe 30 years or more, hmm. even though I uh, published a book, uh, The PK, PK Man, Man yeah. which deals with uh, an extraordinary UFO sighting and, and probably a few others. I know uh, his name's Owens, but uh, it's <laughs> funny. Uh, my mother's maiden name was Owen. Oh. So interesting. Uh-huh. Probably no correlation whatsoever. Well, it, it, it's interesting because I did discover in the course of writing the book a, a number of synchronicities involving the name Owen or Owens. Uh, but one of the things that I gleaned from other people who attend these conferences, and I know you've been to several, probably many is a better term, uh, it's been described to me by, for example, Jacques Vallée, a very prominent UFO researcher who does not attend these conferences. He says they're rarely, rarely does. Yes, he probably does on occasion. But yeah. he, for him, he says they're like circuses. He wants nothing to do with them. I would tend to agree with him. Uh huh. That's what I've seen. Yeah. Uh, they've turned, uh, you know. When I first got involved in 91 was Mm -hmm. the very first UFO Congress in Tucson, Arizona, Mm -hmm. put on by Wendell Stevens. And it had more fact-finding, sharing, openness, um, genuine interest, Mm -hmm. not a uh, freak show or, uh, you know, presentation by my book kind of thing, which Mm -hmm. is... More or less, what it's turned into. Yeah. Um, it's a sideshow. It, it's, or at least, it works for some people, and they've been able to make really good livings in mm-hmm. this niche market. Um, but I get the impression a lot of the people who are making a good living at it, it's like who can tell the tallest tale. And that's what people seem to want, which is just, I. I It's hard for me to comprehend that people can be that gullible Mm -hmm. and want that kind of thing to fill their minds with. You know, I don't want to rip my my head space with that. Yeah. Uh, I would much rather go to it, and this is why I go, Mm -hmm. is to be available for those other people who are searching, who don't know any better, but are going there looking around wide-eyed and heart open trying to find some kind of correlation, corroboration, uh, connection Mm -hmm. that that they can find out that their lives, that they're not insane, that these things are real, that these events do happen, Mm -hmm. and that you're not alone in them. 
Well, one of the leading figures in the field today is Whitley Strieber, who right. written so all of Whitley. these books yeah. about about his his contact experience, and I gather those experiences typically occur to him in a hypnagogic state when he's uh, nearly asleep. It's a, a unique state of consciousness. It's an interior experience. Occasionally, there are right. uh, correlates of that experience in the external world, like sightings. Sure. sure. Uh, What's interesting about Willie's work mm -hmm. is initially... He was really frightened by it all. Yeah. And then two decades later, he's saying, hey, maybe we ought to find out more about how these guys think, mm -hmm. what they see, yeah. what they understand, what they're trying to share with us, obviously having a more advanced consciousness, which is a complete different as I you recall, know, the title of his a, first book and, and, and his first nonfiction right. book was called Communion. He yeah. he was talking about a yeah, a spiritual experience. That's the word communion is typically associated right. with. It it is, and with those experiences, um, you know, maybe it's a, the the way the movie was presented initially too. That yeah. kind of had a little fearful thing. Mm -hmm. But what he has continued to say over time is that, look, you know, these experiences really shouldn't be fearful. You shouldn't be a, a or maybe the shouldn't, uh, I don't know if I want to shoot on you or not. Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe a different view is really what we need to have just right. to suspend our belief system, if we can, mm -hmm. for a moment. Yeah. And allow whatever it is to present to us without constraints or without feeling, you know, being in the fearful mm -hmm. state. When you when you fear, it's like you tighten up, right? I call it the butt pucker effect. <laughs> right? And when you can release and allow that, this is one of the things uh, an experience. Just as an aside, quickly with a reptilian, what we might call a draconian. Mm -hmm. Had I not been able to take a breath and relax and, and release the tension, mm -hmm. I probably would have had a fight or flight response to the it, energy yeah. that I was being presented with. You you were talking now about a uh, an actual, gonna, I'm going to call it a visionary experience that you had. For all practical purposes, it could be seen as a visionary. It seemed real because I was fully conscious in, but I had my eyes closed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a lot of these are other dimensional beings. Yeah. They rarely, if ever, show up in the, solid form. In solid form. Mm -hmm. But just as the bandwidth through, through the electromagnetic spectrum, yeah. the, the lowest, the red, as we see the color, is the most condensed. We might yeah. be that red zone. Okay. Well, when you have thousands of people reporting interior experiences that have common characteristics, the temptation, and I think it's a realistic temptation, is to say that there could be, even though these are subjective experiences, there could be an objective dimension to them. Absolutely, especially mm -hmm. since there's so much continuity yeah. in them, and it's growing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an organization called Free that just uh, did a bunch of surveys and they just released the information, all from contactees. I'm not yeah. sure if there's four or five thousand in them, but it's the uh, again subjective results. But it's still a survey, and people were able to say yes, I you know there are common patterns in the collective subjective experiences of absolutely. thousands of people, and I gather that. Uh, one of the functions that these conferences have is for people who are having these weird experiences that are very hard to communicate, even to parents and right. siblings, because people are inclined to think you're crazy if you describe them. It's a place where these people can come and find a, a community of understanding and support, even with the circus-like atmosphere. Oh, absolutely. And I think for me... That's what gives it value. Mm -hmm. It's just to be available. You never know who you're going to meet, who, you know, what kind of conversations you're going to have, what I might offer to someone that 
changes their whole perspective and gives them a new insight yeah. that makes their life much better. Mm -hmm. And that, by and large, is consistently what I'm able to do. Yeah. Um, sometimes I can't. Somebody, yeah. you know, sometimes their belief system is so rigid, mm -hmm. and their experience has edified that so much that they're unable to release that at the time. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it happens. Most people, most abductees, uh, that's kind of a misnomer because there's a conscious, not just response, but there's an agreement that happened long before if we go down that road. Yeah. And that so these experiences are all part of the soul's progression, mm -hmm. and they're supposed to happen when they do. We don't know what that timeline is going to be, but it's going to happen when it's supposed to. And eventually, those the, those experiences that seem negative to begin with, over time, those change. Travis, As, Travis Walton is a perfect example. Streber and Travis Walton. Right. Now, in your case, you got deeply involved in uh, the Ashtar Command uh, group. Yes. Um, in, in fact, you became nearly, I, I might call, <laughs> a central figure. Uh, there was an attempt. Mm -hmm. to, to do that and not my own. Yeah. Um, but it felt like, okay, let's, because of my history mm -hmm. over a 20 year period, which included, uh, both visionary experiences and many synchronicities that led you to, uh, feel a compatibility with your path. Too and, many things that I just had yeah. to finally said, okay, I'll acquiesce to this possibility. Yeah. And explore it from that place, not necessarily accepting the reality yet, but yeah. it, it, if it is true, it'll prove itself and, over time. And you and I had an earlier conversation about my interest in archetypal synchronistic resonance and sure. how, in my case, I experienced that in, in the context of reincarnation as an archetype. And I think it could also, it, in fact, I think it does happen with people in the UFO community as well, that synchronicities coalesce together to uh, bring people to that, that feeling of uh, excitement and compatibility, uh, and often, as in your case, it, it didn't last, to my understanding. No, and uh, I and it wasn't because necessarily that it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. It was because the uh, individuals and, and the collective involved wasn't ready to go to that level of reality for them, mm -hmm. you know, in, in anything. And, and not that I was wanting to be a central figure or, or not. That wasn't the point. The point has always been for me is growing the consciousness so that we can all learn how to work together. You know, mm -hmm. harmony among people and planet is my yeah. theme. And so, Which we discussed in a previous interview on the sure. New World Order, but you got disillusioned. I did. And, and so I just let it go and, and I realized that you know, people sometimes, no matter what you do, how or how prepared they may think they are in any belief system, mm -hmm. when something shows up, and it's faith-based, yeah. when something or someone shows up to fulfill that reality and make it, you know, uh, skin and bones and sinew and the, mm -hmm. the whole physical 3D reality... They balk, mm -hmm. they run, and they become angry and projective and pejorative and all kinds of things. Well, that, you also, as I recall, had a number of insights as to what drew these individuals to this organization, uh, the Ashtar Command, sure. in the first place. Absolutely. And as we you know, think about, imagine this, if you will, um, there's a a level of consciousness that we reside in that has a continuity and that we are somehow a part of and agree to participate in some way by giving our lives to it. Mm -hmm. And then we don't realize that until we're here in body wanting to find out what our form, fit, and function is in the world. Mm -hmm. And then these ideas, these concepts, the precepts, the 
um, the experiences, the visions, the mm-hmm. hearing voices, the all these kinds of things lead us down this path to a greater understanding and awareness that then at some point creates a, a coalescing energy that brings people of like mind, heart, soul, spirit together mm-hmm. for a purpose. And that purpose may be different, you know, the overall yeah. one being, of course, harmony among people and planet. Well, I it, it strikes me that for almost every person, as they get to that point, they're drawn into an organization It seems to be leading to greater possibilities, and surely the idea of contact with a, a, another civilization sure. from elsewhere uh, is, is very exciting to Absolutely. people. What could be more exciting? And uh, then, though, everybody at some point is going to have to confront their own inner darkness, mm-hmm. their own inner demons. They have to learn to dance with their shadow effectively. Yeah. Um, and and it would seem to me that's often a make-or-break point for people. Especially when someone wants control mm-hmm. or they want to do something. You know, mm-hmm. one of the things that uh, I was taught early on is you don't push or pull energy. You set your intent, you take action, and you observe what's happening in front of you. And it, uh, Chiksen Mahaley calls it flow. Yes. And it's operational. It works. Mm -hmm. Most of us can't trust that it does because we're used to the the personal self and Mm -hmm. the self-aggrandizement or the... Um, personal needs and the selfishness and mm-hmm. you know instead of being selfish we need to learn how to be selfishly selfless and i gather in your experience uh, in these communities you you run into a lot of people who weren't able to make that leap i don't know that i am in some cases <laughs> yeah. right right um so how can i expect others to do so if i if i can't so i understand that yeah there's there's a whole um uh, panoply of emotions of trials and errors and tribulations Mm -hmm. and things that come up for people in this process. What I see is that too often we get distracted into the sideshows, into the arguments, into the us and them, instead of looking at it from a, okay, what can we Mm -hmm. do? Mm -hmm. And as a professional facilitator, this is what I've been trained to do is bring people together on the same page to you know, to work on projects together. Mm-hmm. Well, I would think that within the ufology community, there's a certain amount of tension between the, the hardcore empirical scientists who are trying to prove it to the, uh, basically to the, uh, to the skeptical scientists sure. who want nothing to do with this field. Uh, and then you have people who are coming at it from a spiritual perspective, often like yourself, people who have felt that they have had contact, direct contact, Mm -hmm. and that there's some uh, tension that these two groups are pulling in different directions. And in a lot of cases they are, because the desire for physical proof doesn't allow that other side, like Tom Campbell, I'm just going to use him as an example again. He says that he's a... uh, a guy that's trying to explain a right brain world to a left brain thinker. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of the same thing because yeah. of the, uh, the the nature of the nuts and bolts of the science side of things. Yeah. We may not have the proper technology to actually analyze the signals. Mm-hmm. Um, there might, you know, the frequencies that are involved. People always report you know these ringing the the sometimes when it they're like with the shabda and the uh, the sound current when you can slow yourself. Could you define that term? Sure, uh, shabda is a Hindu term that simply means sound current, and it's the combination of the frequencies of all uh, things on the planet. Okay, and so it it, heart, it becomes a single frequency, mm-hmm. uh, generally fairly high pitched. Mm-hmm. So these kinds of things become 
available. People hear them. They're not quite sure what to do about them. They hear the ringing, sometimes on one side, sometimes on the other. Sometimes it's in the center of the head, but they always feel like it's some kind of transmission. Yeah. Now, what if we were able to not think about it, you know, because the first thing we want to do is analyze. What if we just slowed ourselves down, listened deeper, got really quiet, and just listened to it without trying to put Mm -hmm. identifiers to it. Yeah. What I found by doing so is that that frequency begins to expand, become lower, and you can almost sense the bandwidth in the various levels of that frequency. It's like the electromagnetic mm -hmm. spectrum, which mm -hmm. also could be the Shabda mm -hmm. in frequency all of a sudden expanding as we learn to listen deeper. Well, it's still the five senses. Mm -hmm. We don't have, it, it doesn't even take a sixth sense. Well, what I hear you saying is that in addition to this circus of human activity mm -hmm. that uh, occurs around the uh, topic of, mm -hmm. of UFOs, there's something else going on, and it has to do with humans discovering their own deep inner nature. And when we do that, when we look deeply into ourselves, we can discover that we are intimately connected with intelligences from beyond the earth. Absolutely. Uh, who are in their own way, which is very different than our normal way of communicating, reaching out to us. Absolutely. And, and like Nepi has offered that, you know, there's... Vernon a, Nepi. Right. There's this uh, nine dimensional things. Yeah. Okay. So each one of those dimensions could have a theme and a consciousness that it relates through that tether mm -hmm. through space and time. We just don't know mm -hmm. how it works yet because we're still too primitive. Yeah. But those people who can travel through time and space have learned that. And the only way that they can is because they've established that frequency that allows mm -hmm. them to do so which can be uh, or hold no malevolence towards anything. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul Hellyer has also made the, the comment that's being a retired defense minister of Canada that they've known for decades there is no threat. But yet we need mm -hmm. to constantly prepare for one just because that's how we are. Yeah, that's who we are, right. not who they are. Right. Okay, well... Of course, and I recall Stephen Hawking <laughs> issuing threats and warnings. He said, <laughs> we better you know, not be in contact with these aliens or they'll do to us what, what the Spanish did when they came right. to uh, Latin America. There's this America. other group called Allies of Humanity, you know, yeah. that believe that they're just here to rape our planet of its resources. Well, if they wanted to do that with their technology, they, they could have done it. Uh -huh. Why haven't they? Yeah. There is no, that I'm aware of, known... Uh, and even Clifford Stone, uh, not Clifford Stone. Um, anyway, there's a, reports of the craft showing up at the missile silos in the oh, 60s yes, and sure. turning them off, uh -huh. doing no physical damage, just turning them off. I'm flashing the book cover <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right now. Right. But So what you're saying is if we want to have a complete sociology of ufology, we have to include not only the human dimension, the uh, circus as it is, right. but also take into account the possibility of uh, extra dimensional or extraterrestrial uh, beings who are in one way or another at the psychic level, at the spiritual level, and sometimes in a physical level, reaching out to us. I often wonder if it's just us reaching out to ourselves and it's other forms of our own consciousness on other dimensions mm -hmm. that we're trying to integrate. Ourselves from the future. If you want to call it that, it's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we're tethered, if space, time, and, and consciousness is tethered, then there's a uh, continuity. There, there's It's a contiguous mm -hmm. um, field that, yeah, there's a lot of possibilities, but there's still this one. Well, you seem to be echoing what the great mystics have always said, which is, we are one with everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, that's a wonderful note to uh, end our conversation on Zen Benefield. Once again, a pleasure to be oh, with you. Absolutely. Thank Fine. you so much. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you for being with us.